Hello, and welcome to today's South by Southwest panel discussion on the topic of why racial justice is essential for health. My name is Jacqueline Adams. I'm your moderator for today's session, and I'm joined by three extraordinary experts. By way of introductions, uh, I am a recovering journalist, having spent more than two decades as a CBS News correspondent. I just co-authored a book called A Blessing, Women of Color Teaming Up to Lead, Empower, and Thrive, and I write a twice-monthly column for the Christian Science Monitor. I have an MBA from Harvard and an insatiable curiosity about information, especially when it comes to people of color. And where health is concerned, the data and the history for Black and BIPOC people paint a troublesome picture a picture that author Nicole Hannah-Jones recently called a network of disadvantages. I'm going to give you just a few facts that were presented at a 2019 conference at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health called 400 Years of Inequity, and I used some of this data in my book. African-American women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. A black woman with an advanced degree is likelier to lose her baby than a white woman with just an eighth grade education. Even worse, certain stereotypes from slavery times have endured to the present, notably the idea that black people do not feel pain in the same way that whites do. And this notion was used to justify whipping and other forms of abuse. Some old myths and misconceptions persist, such as that black bodies have fewer nerve endings than white bodies, that black skin is thicker than white skin. Well, how silly, how ridiculous you might say. And yet a 2016 survey in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of white medical students and residents found that half, half, of the respondents still believe and act on these inaccurate beliefs. We don't need to go back to 2016 or 2019. On March 1st of this year, the Centers for Disease Control reported that in Arizona, 13% of coronavirus vaccinations have gone to Hispanic people, while they account for 36% of the cases, 31% of the deaths, and 32% of the total population in that state. Similarly, in Maryland, black people have received just 17% of vaccinations, while they make up 33% of the cases, 35% of the deaths, and 30% of the total population in that state. Now, these facts kind of make you go, hmm, we're going to try to dig down and find hopefully a little bit of good news with our three esteemed panelists. And so you're prepared. I will introduce each panelist before I ask him and hims and her uh, a few questions. First up, we have Dr. Harold L. Paz. Um, he, Dr. Paz is the executive vice president and chancellor for health affairs at the Ohio State University and he's the chief executive officer of the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. At Ohio State, Dr. Paz leads all seven health science colleges, and he serves as CEO of the $4 billion Wexner Medical Center enterprise. In that role, he oversees seven hospitals, a nationally ranked college of medicine, more than 20 research institutes, multiple ambulatory sites, and a accountable care organization and a health plan. What a list. Now, speaking personally, I have especially warm feelings about Ohio State. My maternal grandfather earned his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree there probably in the early 1900s. And that knowledge has made me want to visit your campus, Dr. Paz. Um, let's start with a, a question about something really extraordinary that you have done on your campus. Um, 
just a few days ago, I read uh, in the New York Times an opinion writer who's a public health researcher at Brown University called for the Department of Health and Human Services, the federal uh, department, to declare racism a public health emergency. And yet last June, you were ahead of this curve and you declared racism a social determinant of health. As the CEO of a major academic health center, why did you find it important to call out racism in this way? Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. And this is an area uh, that is an enormous priority for us. And, and let me give you some of the background as to why. So at Ohio State and at the Wexner Medical Center, we've had uh, years of investment in addressing uh, disparity and the need to have diversity among our workforce and to reach into the community to address multiple determinants of health. We're enormously proud that in 2020, Forbes selected Ohio State Wexner Medical Center as the fourth most diverse employer in the nation after companies like Procter & Gamble and the computer firm SAP. So we have this track record, but we felt it was extraordinarily important, particularly during the pandemic and when issues of structural racism reached the front pages of all of our newspapers in the past number of months, that we stand forward and really address this um, as, as important as it is. So why a determinant of health? Well, it starts with an understanding of determinants of health. There are really two measures that look at populations and look at health effects. So one is, do people die a premature death? It's extraordinarily important and it's very measurable and very tragic when anyone does die a premature death. The other is, how do individuals rate their own health status in terms of being healthy and well? And there are a number of surveys that allow individuals to actually rate their health status. We know that there are five major determinants of health, and this part is really important. So healthcare per se, that's the thing that the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center is primarily in the business of, which is delivering healthcare to individuals. It attributes to roughly 20% as a determinant of health of longevity and health and well-being, 20%. But there are the balance of, of the other determinants of health include genetics, for example, you know, the cards that we were dealt by our parents when we were born, the genetic cards, roughly maybe seven to ten percent. Environmental determinants of health, and you know, examples, there are numerous examples: ozone in the air, air pollution, climate change even lead in the water, are all exceptionally important environmental determinants of health, roughly about 5%. And then the balance fall into two major categories, the behavioral determinants of health, and those are largely addiction to tobacco, alcohol, opioids, and exercise and obesity. But when you take all of those four away, you're left with social determinants, 40% of that pie chart I just described, the largest and probably the most important. So what are social determinants of health? Transportation, housing, food insecurity, poverty, crime, and we believe racism. Racism is an extraordinarily important social determinant of health for those that face racism and discrimination. There is ample evidence that being in an environment where one is the recipient of, of prejudice and racism causes oxidative stress, earlier, more greater likelihood of having a coronary event, poor wound healing, obesity. These are health effects that emanate from a social determinant, just like food insecurity, housing, poverty, a lack of education, challenges in getting access to transportation. And we think for minority communities, primarily Black Americans and Latinx Americans, this has an important effect that had to be described, particularly given the circumstances of the past year. And we know with regard to COVID-19 that the mortality rate for Black Americans is roughly twice that of white Americans. We know that for the Latinx population, more likely to become ill with COVID than for non-Hispanic whites. 
there is ample evidence to look at that. And specifically, when you look at age groups that take out the elderly, which is where the predominance of deaths among white Americans occur, and you look at the group between 45 and 55 and compare whites to black Americans, there are very significant differences. The data that you just uh, reported about the COVID deaths was uh, a part of the, um, the uh, CDC uh, data that I read at the beginning. Um, I, I just wanted to ask uh, about the um, National Academy of Sciences data that I read when we began. Um, and it talked about the, the bias that is in half of the medical students um, among your determinants. Have you or can you unteach bias among the medical students? It is exceptionally important to begin in the educational program and process uh, to address racism and to create opportunities to address it. And so at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, we have launched an anti-racism action plan focused on our most vulnerable populations. It's a collaborative effort across the Wexner Medical Center and all seven of our health science colleges. And I'll just mention that our seven health sciences colleges that run everything from veterinary medicine, which you mentioned a few minutes ago, to dentistry, optometry, public health, of course, nursing and medicine, um, have 10,000 students on a single campus. It's an extraordinary opportunity to create these programs and then initiate them. And our focus is on elevating our commitment to um, anti-racism, to engage and equip our faculty, our staff, and our students, and other learners, also patients and our communities about the importance of engaging this, and then to empower faculty, staff, and students with ways to have an impact, but ultimately to evaluate that impact. We believe that it's, it's exceptionally important to continue to evaluate the impact of these programs, beginning in the curriculum and all the way through. This year, we launched an initiative across the seven health science colleges, our School of Allied Health, as well as the School of College of Social Work, to create, um, to create an educational program of interprofessional education as we address racism, including service learning, because we believe that opportunities for service learning working in the community are one of the best ways that we can think of to engage our students in the curriculum to address these issues. Just one more quick question before I, I move on to Dr. Frederick. Um, how are you leveling the playing field so that your Black and Latinx medical students, your BIPOC medical students can succeed in their educations and subsequent careers? Well, first and foremost, it's about making sure that we have an exceptionally diverse student body. Um, and I'm enormously proud of the progress that's been made here at Ohio State. For example, in our College of Medicine, since 2013, minority medical school representation jumped from 13% to 26% of our incoming students in 2019. We're ranked fourth in the nation in terms of the number of underrepresented minority students. Now you'd say, you know, the solution is really simple, just offer more acceptances to minority students and you will have created greater diversity. We know that just offering acceptances will not get you there. It's the students that choose to come to your institution after they're accepted that it really makes the difference. It's how many matriculate, not how many are offered acceptances. And in order to achieve high rates of matriculation for minority students, you have to have a culture within the institution that's welcoming, that is attractive, that engages students and retains students. That takes years to develop, but it requires leadership and it requires investment and the full participation of faculty and staff. At Harvard Business School, the, uh, the students, the current students uh, say that they have increased the yield of the uh, accepted students by, I love this phrase, embracing them with love. Thank you so much, Dr. Potts. I'm gonna move on to uh, Dr. Frederick and we'll come back to you in a few minutes. Our next panelist is Dr. Wayne Frederick, who is the president of Howard University, the nation's most prestigious historically black college and one of four medical schools among the HBCUs. Dr. Frederick also serves as the chair of surgery at Howard's Medical School. 
having received his bachelor's degree and his MD at, at the tender age of 22, both at Howard University. Dr. Frederick conducted postdoctoral research and surgical oncology fellowships at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, and he was then appointed associate director of the Cancer Center at the University of Connecticut. As we say, Dr. Frederick is lettered up. I uh, had not met Dr. Frederick before today, but again, I do have a personal connection to him. My co-author, Benita Stewart, is a proud Howard alumna, and Dr. Frederick very graciously provided a blurb for our book, and he wrote, the original research offers a fresh new look at how American competitiveness depends on the robust inclusion of women of color. Here, here. Now, I have a chance to say thank you to Dr. Frederick in person. Um, welcome, Dr. Frederick. 2020 was an especially traumatic year for Black Americans with constant reminders of nonstop, highly publicized murders. Um, I heard last month that 100 Black people have been killed by police since George Floyd's death on May 25th. And of course, the trial of his alleged killer is beginning. And yet some people are saying and feeling that American society has already just moved on. How have your students and the Howard community coped with this very real and very public trauma? Well, it certainly has been difficult, as you can imagine. Um, we have been uh, supportive of one another, but also staying in the fight. The reality is that Howard's charter was signed on March 2nd, 1867. And for the past 154 years, we've been on a caravan to social justice. One that right now, as you mentioned, has swollen. And we're happy for those who have joined the caravan, but the ultimate, just, the ultimate destination, which is social justice, is one that still remains in the distance and one that we are going to continue um, going. So what we have continued to do uh, is the blocking and tackling that is necessary. Um, during the pandemic, we stood up uh, testing sites in Ward 7 and 8, where it's 95% um, African-American. DC is a very small city. In Ward 3, that's 95% white. Uh, the life expectancy of a white woman is some 20 something years longer than the life expectancy of a black male in Ward 7 and 8. And so we felt it was necessary to get testing for COVID in those neighborhoods. We've since stood up a vaccination center as well. And uh, what we're seeing is that people see Howard University as a trusted messenger. And so we've been coping by action. We've been coping by continuing to do what we must do. And while others have joined the caravan, what we are going to make sure they do is leave us with new tires, um, more gas, um, et cetera, and that they leave with the knowledge that this is a struggle that has had a long tail of the history and still has a lot of road to travel, but we will be here traveling that road. I know um, Michael Bloomberg just a bit. I served on a civic board when he was mayor of New York. What will his gift of $32.8 million mean for your medical students? And, and has Mayor Bloomberg's gift inspired others? Yeah, Mayor Bloomberg's gift um, has been transformational, to be quite honest. Uh, when you look at student debt, especially for minority students, uh, student debt uh, is now well over 200000 for medical students of color. And so his gift, which is intended to decrease student debt by at least 100,000 for each of those students receiving that grant, um, is transformational. Those students now can go out and decide to do specialties that they otherwise may be apprehensive about because of the load of student debt. Uh, they can also go out and practice in neighborhoods where they can really fulfill uh, ultimately what their mission is. And so his gift has been very important and it has been um, a, an inspirational gift and inspired others uh, to join us as well. And so we're continuing to work with um, him and others to continue to support our students and support the overall mission of Howard University's College of Medicine. We received 11,100 applications this year. We will only take a class of 130. We were the seventh most selective medical school prior to the cycle. And so we would like to expand that incoming class because we think that there are a lot more African-American students who can do medicine in this country. 
Um, I'm going to come back to that when we do our quick fire at the end, but but just a very quickly, um, given your experience, do you agree with Dr. Paz that racism is a social determinant of health? Uh, most certainly it is. Um, you cited uh, one of those articles. There's another article that was written in the Journal uh, of the American Medical Association. In that article, a implicit and explicit bias test was given two medical students entering Johns Hopkins School of Medicine prior to them having one day of instruction. And what it found was a simple question like, who is more equipped to sign and, and understand and inform consent? And they had a picture of a white toll booth operator and a black male lawyer. And the majority of medical students felt that the white toll booth operator was more equipped what was, though, encouraging about that study, and I believe Dr. Paz alluded to this, is that they also were able to then demonstrate evidence that if you did persist and teach those students specifically around those issues of, of their biases, that you could get them to impact their minds in terms of how they would then deliver care, and that ultimately that care would not have a negative impact on their patient. So it means that we have to be very, very uh, proactive about our curriculum and teaching about bias. Thank you. We were looking for a few hopeful nuggets and, and you've just provided one. Thank you. I, I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Deborah Furholden. And, and sadly, I, I do not have a personal connection with uh, Dr. Furholden, at least not yet. By the end of today, we might. Um, she is the Associate Dean for Public Health Integration and the Director of the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions at Michigan State University. Her Flint Center is funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She's an epidemiologist and a classically trained public health professional. She focuses on drug and alcohol dependence, epidemiology, psychiatric epidemiology, and prevention science. Welcome, uh, Dr. Furholden. Um, let's start with the same question that I've asked the two gentlemen. Do you agree with Dr. Paz that racism is a social determinant of health? And, and if so, has your Center for Health Equity Solutions developed any specific strategies for combating structural racism that could be adapted across the country? Yes, that, so I, it just warms my heart, you know, because there's a lot of us who've been crying out and people often will talk about race as a social determinant of health. Race is not a social determinant of health. There's nothing unique or special or biologically um, determining that, you know, that would pr have race predict health outcomes. It is in fact what race gives way to. Race gives way to racism. Racism shapes how you see yourself and how others see you. Racism operates at multiple levels. It's both institutionalized, it's personally mediated, mediated, it's internalized. Racism is causally linked to opportunity and access. Racism, and I love how Dr. Paz put it, it causes people to live sicker and die younger. We now have good data that tell us experiences of racism and discrimination actually get under the skin and impact people's health and how long they can expect to live. So by definition, it is a social determinant of health. And I love it when Dr. Paz puts that out because it really will take leaders in our nation to put that at the forefront to help shape people's thinking about it. And more importantly, why it's important to view it through that lens is because you can't change your race and most of us wouldn't want to. I'm proud of my African uh, American um, heritage, but we can change racism. And so that's really important because if we talk about race, it puts the responsibility on the person for something that's outside of their hands. But if we talk about racism and structural racism, it now all of a sudden becomes our problem and something that we can actually do something about. It's impossible for me as a news person to talk to someone from Flint, Michigan without mentioning the water crisis. First of all, how are you and, and how are your citizens? So Flint is a really amazing, strong, great city filled with, um, you know, really hardworking. And these are the kind of people that you'd want in your neighborhood. These are the kind of people you want in your family. They show up for each other. 
Um, you know, it's the birthplace of General Motors. We had our first sit down strike. Uh, right in, in Flint, Michigan. It was the birthplace of the American dream. It was a place where you could graduate from high school, go get a job in the plant, buy a home, own a car, a new car that came right off the line that maybe you had a hand in putting together. Um, and so it's really just uh, beyond unjust and unacceptable what was done in Flint. The whole entire city was poisoned. We talk about it as an environmental justice or environmental racism, but I don't want to soften it. I want people to understand that an entire city of really amazing people were poisoned. So how are we doing? We're still dealing with the stress and trauma of that experience um, because we are mighty strong, uh, resilient people. Um, you, you've seen just the power of, of, of a strong spirit, but I think it's unfair to ask people to continue to, thrive in the face of so much adversity without any justice being served. So we're doing okay. The water is better. It's not totally resolved because irreparable damage was done to our water infrastructure, but we're moving in the right direction. Um, and people will tell you, don't just think of water when you think of Flint. I appreciate you letting us know, but we have many, many great things that are afoot in Flint. Wonderful, that's terrific to hear. Are there lessons that you have learned from the water crisis that can be adapted to other types of environmental or public health issues? I think so. So there's a couple of things, and this is a new area that I'm really taking on. Most of my research has been in the area of health equity and health disparities, right? So I always look for where the differences are, and then I look upstream and say, what are the real systems and structures that give way to those differences that we see downstream? That's sort of a quick version of the distinction between disparities and inequities. And there's a real business case for equity, yeah. right? There's a real business case. And what we don't, and, and even better, we've learned this in, in COVID, also a business case for being prepared and for preparedness. So the cost of replacing what would need to be replaced in our water treatment facility and adding, adding an anti-corrosive to the water in Flint, it would have been about a million dollars to upgrade the water treatment plant it would have been about 80 to $150 a day, depending on who you ask, to put an anti-corrosive in the water. Either one of those things could have prevented this entire thing. We have now spent more than a billion dollars of taxpayer money, more than $1 billion of taxpayer money. That doesn't include philanthropic dollars. It doesn't include all of the tremendous outpouring of gifts and other things um, that, have, that have come from our society at large, because a lot of people you know, really looked out for Flynn and showed up for us. Um, and so we've learned some lessons. Um, the the short-term trade-off and gain of switching the water supply has now been way outmatched by a billion dollars of our taxpayer money going to restore a city and help it recover when it could have been avoided for a million dollar investment up front. So the business case for equity and the business case for preparedness is one that I think we need to keep unpacking. We've got just uh, about a minute, minute and a half before I open it up to everyone, but just one final question. You focus on psychiatric epidemiology. How should uh, BIPOC people cope with structural racism in their environments? And, and you, we have this example in, in Flint. How should experts like yourself uh, cope with structural racism? So I want to start first with, I think, what needs to happen at the level of indi individual. And I cannot stress this enough. And this is true for every single human being on the planet. I tell people that your well-being is the most important thing on the planet. Right. When you get on a plane and you're flying with an infant or a, an elderly loved one or somebody with a disability, the flight attendant tells you you have to put your mask on first. And the first time I heard that, I thought that was just such ridiculous advice. I was there with my two small children. They were both under three. I thought, who would do that? And this, the flight attendant looks at me. She says, you seem to sort of be upset. And I said, well, you must not have children. She says, let me explain to you something. If this plane goes down and we lose cabin pressure, once you've run out of oxygen, you can't help them. You've got to put your mask on for first. And I just will never forget that. And so as somebody who's been trained in public mental health, it is so important for people to make sure they put their mask on first. You cannot change the world if you are not fit for the fight. So I encourage everybody to practice self-care. Uh, it's really cool because a lot of the things that we're doing in COVID, if people would wash their hands 
more if people would you know be mindful of how they interact with others and in in those ways not not interact hug and kiss and be merry and all that but if people would wash their hands and be more mindful um, of their social interactions if people would be more mindful of how much emissions they're using because they're driving instead of walking and some of those things boy we could come out of this really um good and strong so i tell people individually practice self-care and for people like myself um, and others in the community. If you're fit for the fight and you've got the will for activism, um, realize that there are people who we need to be holding accountable. We give people our votes. We give people our money. We give people our time and talents and treasures. And we need to be um, requiring that those people be real allies and advocates with us in the fight for a world that works and is fair to everyone. Thank you so much. I, I love your emphasis on self-care. I was someone who just, you know, just charged ahead. And, and it's only recently, I mean, I'm an old lady, but it's only recently that I've learned about this notion of self-care. So there's a lot we can learn from the young people. So thank you, Dr. Furholden. Now we're going to move into the next part of our conversation. And I think we've got about 20 minutes to get through probably more questions that I have that, uh, that, than you can answer. And feel free to, to jump in. So let's begin. I've been told that there's been an increase, and, and Dr. Frederick, you mentioned this a bit, in the number of the BIPOC students applying to medical schools following this year of pandemic. Um, each of you, are you seeing increases in applications to your medical school? And, and also, are students choosing different uh, majors or specialties as a result of this year of pandemic? Oh, well, we certainly have seen a 30% increase in our applications. However, I'm still concerned because in 1978, there were more African-American males in this country who applied to and subsequently matriculated into our medical schools than in 2015. So this increase is not just welcome, it's bringing us back to a baseline that's uh, decades uh, behind. And so we have to go above that, well be above that to get there. The other thing I would say that's concerning is that Howard University still sends more African Americans to medical school than any other institution in this country and has produced more black physicians than any other single institution. Those two factors, while we are proud of that, it again means that we're carrying an unusual burden uh, for a country of 300 million people with an entire student body all 13 schools and colleges of 10,000 students. Those numbers are dire. And it means that we must double our efforts around this because we do have a national crisis around this issue. Dr. Paz? We're seeing an increase as well at, at Ohio State in terms of applicants to medical school from underrepresented minority students. I think nationally, actually, the number is 17% uh, as an increase overall in applications. So it, it's, it's as, as President Frederick said, very promising, but we need to do more and we need to make sure that uh, we're successful in not only, as I said, getting in applications, but matriculating students. In terms of residency programs, um, we're seeing that two, two, two programs in particular, anesthesia and emergency medicine, uh, are, um, are successful in, in recruiting into their residencies underrepresented minority students. We, you know, we're delighted to see that, but we want to see more students go into primary care because of the enormous need that exists to serve local communities. And we think this is a very important opportunity, as is mental health services, areas like psychiatry, for example, enormously mm -hmm. important. Um, the fact of the matter is there is so much left to do that progress in any direction, in any discipline, I would say is, is enormous progress, but there are areas that we definitely want to emphasize. Dr. Ferholden, we know that COVID-19 is impacting the BIPOC populations at a disproportionately higher rate. We've, we've discussed this, that all through our time together. But I'm told that Michigan is making strides in closing that gap. What is Michigan doing that others could and should be? Yeah, so I, I sit on our Michigan um, Coronavirus Task Force, and we also have a local task force. I think what the thing that we realized is that we couldn't deal with this at the level of individual and that the interventions would actually have to match the level of the problem. So initially when COVID came out, they tried to explain away and I say, they, this, is, this happened in mainstream media. We even had some people, well-meaning health professionals, try to explain away the differences because of pre-existing health conditions. 
And later we find out that only actually accounted for about 10 to 15 percent of uh, the excess deaths. It doesn't really explain how one would be more likely to become a case. So in Michigan, for example, and this is true all over the country, what we found is that a lot of people of color are just we're just more likely to have to be engaged and out in the workforce, less likely to have a job where they could just shelter in place and switch over to Zoom, more likely to have to scramble to make ends meet. Uh, you know, less likely to be insured, even coming into COVID. So then, you know, initially when we had things like uh, testing, you needed a primary care physician prescription, you needed a car, you needed, you know, you needed all these things. And so we started to really deal with the cracks in our system of care and we implemented solutions that match the actual problems. So barrier-free community testing, you know, um, enhanced unemployment, a federal program that the state began to supplement, you know, um, we matched the solutions to the level of the problem. And lo and behold, within about five, six months, we closed that gap in COVID cases and deaths. I think we're the only state that I know of who can say that we did that. And that gap remains closed. Um, and so th the one thing I will stress, though, is if we take our foot off the gas, it, there would be no reason to expect that we wouldn't revert right back to that. And it is truly my hope that what we've learned in this pandemic about really addressing these social and structural and political determinants of health, that we bring that same sense of urgency, that same warp speed to solving the problems of health disparities and health inequities that predated COVID and will likely outlive COVID. Right. When we began, I uh, read the stats about the deficits in the distribution of coronavirus vaccines among Black and Hispanic people in Arizona and Maryland. What about the disparity in Ohio or Washington, D.C.? And it sounds as if you've sort of closed that gap or, or taken steps in Michigan. That's a great question. And, and we've, uh, we've certainly identified opportunities there as well. And the steps we're taking are including opening up a, a vaccine site in our Near East community at Ohio uh, Hospital East, Ohio State Hospital East, because we know that if we can open vaccine centers in the middle of communities that are underserved and primarily predominantly minority, we have a better chance of, uh, of broadening the distribution of vaccines. We're also asking our, our health science students to go into the local communities and to work with individuals, but also with community organizations to address vaccine hesitancy. We think that's enormously important. A lot of the opportunities we have around building trust in local communities and making it available. One of the things we did early on in the pandemic was to go into local communities with what we called COVID care kits. And that included masks and hand sanitizer and information about how to protect oneself from COVID. So it's this ongoing initiative to work in local communities, in the minority communities, underserved communities, building trust and offering resources. Vaccine uh, is one part, but COVID testing is another, opening a COVID testing site in the middle of those communities. And again, it's built on other initiatives. These things can't be a one and done. You can't just start it last month and hope you're gonna have a deep and long lasting impact. We've had programs here like our Moms to Be program that address early infant mortality that have been going on for almost a decade. Community health workers going into our minority communities, eight different parts of the greater Columbus area to address early infant mortality, which is an enormous challenge in this state and identifying ways that moms can prevent early infant mortality by supporting them with everything from cribs to nutrition. These are relatively simple things to do unless they're not accessible to you. And if they're not accessible to you, they're not simple. But when you have a health system of this size with these resources and 10,000 students that really do want to engage, these are the opportunities that we believe are our responsibility to undertake. We've got only about five minutes left, and I want to get into one more big topic and, and have all of you address it. Um, you're all academics. Uh, as I've mentioned, Harvard Business School is what I know. And in the wake of George Floyd's murder, a special racial justice task force was set up with seven pillars and seven to 10 initiative, new initiatives under each of the pillars. If the world had never seen what happened to George Floyd, would we be even having these discussions about race today? 
are, are we experiencing just a moment that could end soon? And, and if it is, how can we, or, or even can we, implement enough changes quickly enough to radically alter a 400-year-old landscape? Dr. Frederick, do you want to start with that? Sure. You know, again, not an easy task. And um, I, I, one of the things I, I hope we will always do is hold George Floyd's um, life in reverence. Uh, because the reality is that uh, the murder of an African-American male cannot become a footnote in history. And unfortunately, uh, we've been doing that for too long. And I think what we have to do is to elevate the sanctity of the humanity that's within these black bodies. That's something that we have been glossing over for so long. And so I think a lot of what must happen and must change does involve major dialogue and sweeping changes, but it also involves the day-to-day -day changes that must occur. Our nutritional science students uh, shop in Ward 7 and 8 with our residents. Um, they don't go to the only two full groceries um, that serve 170,000 citizens, the exact definition of a de of food desert, but they go to the corner stores. They meet them where they are. They talk to the owners of those co corner stores because like everything else, as we start building out, we must attack these problems with some practical solutions. We have a professor that teaches a class um, in, in and out uh, where she takes students into the prison system so they understand the pipeline to, to prison. They understand the systemic nature of those things so that when they go back out, they must come back with an idea to solve it. But ultimately, we all have to be able to sit down and respect each other's humanity and attack that change. And that's what this is about. So whether it's in Flint, Michigan, whether it's George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, or whether it is that young uh, middle schooler who is right now in one of our public schools being denied an opportunity to take an advanced class or encouraged, not being, not having confidence instilled in them, that is something that we have to block and tackle on every single day. And I hope that um, all of us will actually recognize that we have a role to play and that we'll play that role to the best of our ability. Dr. Ferholden, I can give you a minute. Big question. Um, yeah, so, um... The, the, the challenges that we face and the, the solutions for them. Um, and and I, I was just really troubled by George Floyd. And I have been really moved by how eye-opening that was for so many people who didn't realize truly how unfair the world was. And if his death is not in vain, and if this pandemic and all the life that has been lost during this pandemic is not in vain because it forced us all to stop and sit still and actually digest and process um, what the reality that we live in a world where we have placed a hierarchy on the value of human life. And people say black lives matter because the reality of it is in this country, the, the value of a black life is viewed as less than the value of a white life. And that's not a world that I wanna live in and I want anybody to inherit. So I think this is a real opportunity for some truth telling and a real reckoning with the history of our past it's a time for racial healing and an opportunity for transformation. And the work will go well beyond what we do right now. The real tell will be what happens in the years to come. Dr. Paz, you got the final word. Thank you. Um, you know, this, this pandemic has been tragic beyond belief, but it's also been transformational. And my hope is, and maybe this reflects the, the optimist I am by nature, that what we've seen in the past several months addressing issues of structural racism in this country and the attention that it's received and the initiatives that have resulted will be long lasting. I think the tragedy of all this would be that we pay attention to it now in this time and then in a year or three years or five years we totally forget about it and we regress to where we were before for everyone, for leaders, for communities, for public leaders, for everybody here on this session, it's our responsibility to make sure that flame doesn't go out. It's our responsibility to keep on fueling that fire of change to address, once and for all, to address structural racism 
If we do that and we don't lose sight of the importance and the efforts that are necessary to be effective and successful, I truly believe that this pandemic will have resulted in changes that needed to come a long time ago, but their time has finally arrived. Sadly, too late, but finally has arrived. It's up to all of us, though, to make that difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hal Paz, Dr. Wayne Frederick, Dr. Deborah Furholden. We could continue talking for hours on this subject. South by Southwest is grateful for your wisdom today, as am I. Thank you, too, to our audience for joining us to consider an important, albeit fraught, subject. I'm Jacqueline Adams. Have a terrific rest of your day. Thank you.